Thorsten Wall. I'm an assistant professor of medicine at Columbia University Medical Center here in New York City. Heart disease is a serious problem for both men and women. Uh, I think uh, it, it used to be very under-recognized in women and uh, we are now much more aware how common it is in women and that women present differently than men with heart problems and um, they need to be screened and they need to be aware of their different presentation, their different symptoms so that they present and see doctors appropriately. Particularly women have to, have to be aware that, that heart disease affects them as well. Uh, there's a common misconception that only men are affected by heart disease and, and uh, women have, to have often different symptoms or don't get symptoms as, as early as men. And uh, the only way to get around that is to see your doctor and have the appropriate checkups up front, check your blood pressure, check your cholesterol, make sure you're not diabetic and understand your risk profile. The better we understand our risk profile, the better we can modify our risk factors and, and the longer we will live healthy. The most important thing I think is keep moving. Uh, particularly as you, as you get older, it's important to continue to exercise as much as you can. And exercise sometimes for an elderly person means go and take a walk. But I think that is very important to continue to stay active, obviously eat healthy, uh, see your physician regularly to make sure that all potential modifiable problems are identified and uh, treated appropriately. My presentation about aortic stenosis um, showed that that uh, it's a common problem and uh, particularly in patients that are elderly, aortic stenosis can often have a large impact on their quality of life but also their life e expectancy. In this current day and age we have modern treatment mechanisms like uh, TAVR or transcatheter aortic valve replacement that we can utilize to treat these patients minimally invasive and give them back their quality of life but also uh, enhance their life expectancy. It took me several years in medical school to learn everything uh, Dr. Reynolds just told you in a, and taught you in about 10-15 minutes. <laughs> so, uh, applause to all of you for keeping up. Uh, these are, it's, it's, it's a little bit challenging sometimes to um, make sure that we don't fall too much into into our jargon when, when we um, uh, give presentations like this, and I will try my very, very best. Um, the good thing is all the difficult topics were covered already. So um, I'm an interventional cardiologist, and that basically means that I'm a plumber. And uh, uh, plumbing in itself is, is uh, uh, pretty simple. So there are, there are, like in any pump, in any house, um, valves whenever there are pipes involved and uh, our heart has four valves. Uh, and what they basically do is they open at the appropriate time to let blood go through, and then they close so blood doesn't accidentally flow backwards. And as we get older, uh, there is a higher uh, incidence of, of valve disease, particularly aortic and mitral valve disease. And tonight we'll focus on the aortic valve. So here's the aortic valve. <coughs> That is the main uh, valve that sits just like in, in this model that I brought. Basically, uh, uh, we have the right ventricle and the left ventricle, and that's the main pumping chamber of our heart, and from there, blood flows out into the main artery, the aorta. And um, the aortic valve has normally three leaflets, as you see up here on top, and those are normally very, very nice and thin. So as, however, um, we get older, and if we're lucky enough to get old enough, I think eventually this will happen to all of us. These valves start to become thicker and uh, more calcified. Similarly to the uh, cholesterol and calcium buildup that you saw before in the arteries, we get uh, similarly calcium buildup in these pockets in uh, our valves. Some people are born, born with just an aortic valve that only has two leaflets, which, which is called a bicuspid valve. And if that happens, then blood flow through that valve is slightly altered, and uh, therefore they calcify as a, at a younger age. And finally, if we get um, uh, rheumatic heart disease, particularly when we have strep B uh, infections in our childhood, then, then again these valves can be attacked and have disease earlier. 
There's one thing that's different in aortic stenosis in women than in men. Women tend to have uh, more fibrotic tissue. So when we measure calcium in the valve by CT scans, and, and this is sort of a difficult graph, but, but if you look at men on the top, the line on the top, and women at the bottom, no matter how we measure the severity of aortic stenosis, if we measure how small the hole is, that's still opening, or if we measure how quickly the blood has to flow through that and squeeze through the hole. What you basically have to assume is, uh, imagine it's like when you take a water hose to water your, your grass, right? If the water hose is fully open, the water comes out at a certain speed. If you put your thumb on it, the same amount of water now still needs to come out, but it shoots out much faster. The same happens in our body with, with the aortic stenosis. If the aortic valve becomes smaller, um, then the blood shoots through much faster and we can measure that. And we can measure that by something called an echocardiogram. That's essentially just an ultrasound of our heart. And here you see the left heart pumping with the mitral valve and the aortic valve. And as you can see up here, it looks like a Mercedes star. Those are very, very nice thin leaflets that are opening fully. You see how big the hole becomes. In contrast, when you look at a patient that has severe aortic stenosis, now this valve becomes much, much more calcified, and the bright spots that you see are calcium, and you can probably appreciate that, that this door now, so to speak, is barely opening, right? It's just opening, wriggling ever so slightly, and it's much harder for the heart to pump the blood, blood out there. What symptoms do patients get? Well, they get chest pressure, chest discomfort, they get short of breath with exertion particularly, and often they might get lightheaded, sometimes so lightheaded that they can actually pass out because not enough blood gets squeezed through the valve. And for many, many years, people might have calcium on, on their aortic valve, but there's a long uh, patent, uh, latent period and, uh, where patients don't have symptoms at all. And then as it, as it progresses to a certain point, then they suddenly start to feel short of breath and they might get uh, pressure in their chest when they exert themselves or feel dizzy. Now, initially there was nothing to be done about this, but luckily in the 1950s, Lowell Edwards came up with this idea that maybe we could, with an open surgery, replace that valve. And initially, um, the valves that were inserted were these uh, ball in a cage valves, so, so the ball would sit in the cage fall down, and then when the, when the heart contracts, the ball gets pushed up, blood moves forward. And you might have had maybe uh, uh, parents that had, had these valves, and, and they would always be able to tell that the valve was making a clicking noise. Anyone in the room could hear that. We now have some more modern valves available than that, but uh, still surgical aortic valve replacement has, has one main advantage. Uh, basically, we can choose between uh, a bioprosthetic valve that has the advantage that we don't have to give long-term blood thinners, or we can give a mechanical valve, particularly in patients that are a little bit younger, that has the advantage that it lasts very long. Um, but it's a very well-established uh, treatment. Now, the story generally is that people don't like open-heart surgery, and there's always going to go somebody go around who's trying to figure out if there's a way to do this differently. So this gentleman, Dr. Henning Anderson, uh, attended a meeting uh, about in the, in the late 1980s. And at that meeting, a lot was talked about these stents. And stents are basically uh, little metal meshes that we use to treat the arteries, for instance, when someone comes in with a heart attack. And he then had the idea to put a valve inside of that stent. So what he did, did he went back home, um, and, and he just bought some, some pick hearts and he sewed in basically a pick heart valve into a metal stent that he crafted himself. And um, this was moved forward and uh, this doctor, Dr. Crebier from France, was then the first one who ever tried a procedure like that in a patient. This was a patient that was turned down for surgery, had severe aortic stenosis, and he got his valve replaced basically with this uh, stented valve. And this has shown the first time that this procedure that you now might have heard about, TAVR or TAVR, transcatheter aortic valve replacement, is technically feasible. So this is sort of an iteration of valves uh, as they've come uh, along. And if you want to pass this around, this is an example of one. Uh, basically, there is a metal cage that um, has then leaflets sewn on the inside. 
and we take this valve and we crimp it on a balloon, make it very small, and then when we are in the body, we go into the leg artery and go up to the heart, and when we're in the body, we, we blow up the balloon. And as the balloon inflates, the valve basically becomes bigger and then stays there and is in that position where we need it. So um, one, of the, one of the impressive things about this is that, that it actually is one of those few things that we can do interventionally in, in, in cardiology um, where lives are saved if patients are treated. So this is data that shows that patients that were, had severe aortic stenosis that underwent this procedure versus in the blue line down here versus those that uh, did not have access to the procedure in the red line uh, lived significantly longer if you looked over the course of five years. And we now have uh, newer generation devices. They have become smaller, so it's easier for us to implant them and we can treat many more patients than we could in the early um, uh, trials. So here's an example of a video how this is performed. You basically see the catheter with the valve. Here is the valve sitting on the catheter. We're loading the balloon into the valve. As we are pushing it up the main aorta, we're basically going backwards against the bloodstream, and then we'll go around the arch. And when we are in position with our valve, so here is the native diseased aortic valve, right? Now we're crossing with this device, and then we're going to basically inflate the balloon once we like our position. Uh, we can check that on echo and on x-ray before we inflate it, and we will inflate our balloon. The valve will be deployed in just a second. It's in real life the same way. We're never quite happy, so we always have to improve it a little bit. Um, and you'll, you'll see just one second. Just because we want to get it right, you have to really get it uh, in, into an optimal position, and you'll check that a couple of times, and here you will see it now. So the balloon goes up, the valve inflates, and then it looks ultimately like that. Okay. So this has now been done many times. We have many uh, different devices. This handle has become more steerable over time. We have now fine control that we didn't have in the past. And that has improved sort of our outcomes. We have less strokes than we used to have. We have less vascular complications. And particularly, women have uh, more vascular complications because their vessels seem to be smaller. And they initially had more strokes than men. Despite of that, women actually have better outcomes in the long term after TAVRA. I'll show you some data. So this is when we compare it to surgery, the overall survival chance for somebody even who's very high risk, so way in their 80s, uh, with this procedure that's done percutaneously and people often can go home after a couple of days or three days now, um, has a 1.4% chance only of a major adverse outcome versus 8.6, which was predicted based on prior uh, surgical data. And uh, Dr. Crevier received uh, the French uh, uh, Medal of Honor for, for the achievement of starting this. And Dr. Anderson uh, doesn't perform the procedures himself, but his dad became one of, got one of these valves recently as well. There are some other concepts that um, work similarly. So this is a, a self-expanding valve, just uh, so that I don't just show the device from from one company. This is the other device that's approved in the United States. That's a self-expanding valve. Also travels up the leg the same way, but it doesn't use a balloon. It takes advantage of a specific property of nitinol, which is an alloy that uh, when we set it in a specific heated setting, that after you fold it down and you let it go, it will always go back to the initial uh, shape that it was set in. And as you can see, as the uh, here we're giving some contrast to make sure our position is good. As they slowly unsheath this valve, it will open up on its own. It's called a self-expandable valve. And um, it's another mechanism of basically doing this, again, minimally invasive um, without open heart surgery. So here you will see it in a second. They're just trying, again, similar to the other device, to optimize the position, move it up just a little bit better. Uh, and then when they like the position, it will slowly unsheath the whole valve and um, take the catheter back out. Now the valve is open and working. Right there you see the leaflets opening and working. So there are many, many different devices, particularly in Europe and the US, we only have two of them. 
there are a couple of things I want to point out that relate uh, to aortic stenosis in women. So initially, there was data that suggested that women um, do much better with um, transcatheter aortic valve replacement than, than with surgery. And that is actually an old story we know for a long time when we look at surgical risk calculators. If you take a man and a woman, and uh, they have all the same risk factors, the same age otherwise, the woman generally will have initially a slightly higher chance for an adverse outcome with the surgery. In the long run, women tend to do better. But um, with TAVR, there was initially a particularly strong signal. But we think over time now, this is more recent data that shows uh, more similar outcomes, again, between men and women with the newer generation devices that I just showed you. And I think that had initially to do with the fact that we didn't have appropriately large sizes for, for the men and there was more leak around it. And some of those are uh, considered potential chances. This is a very difficult um, thing to understand, even, even for doctors, but this is a, um, this is a meta-analysis where we look at many, many studies. The only reason why I'm showing it is uh, it, it makes the point that so things that are on this side of the one show that women do better, things on that side of the uh, line show that men do better. If you look at many of these uh, TAVR studies, that in the long run, women always have longer and better survival, actually, than men if they undergo these procedures. And so that's, I think, one reason um, uh, to point out, because, because women are sometimes a little bit afraid of these uh, considered more invasive, bigger procedures. But, but they ultimately do very well if, if they uh, get treated that way. Okay. So and again, thank you for your attention. And uh, we're happy to answer any questions.